Well, hello there, Retro PC Durham. Chris here, and um, I've got the Activa S series uh, back on the workbench. Um, as far as time goes, it's been a fair amount of time since I've done a video on this. Uh, you know, it was originally supposed to be a pretty quick series. Bought this thing last year, um, or maybe almost two years ago now, and wanted to refurbish it and restore it, and you know, have this kind of dream PC from from my mid to late 90s or 96 97 time period um set up in my uh, office here as kind of a showcase um but it needs a lot of work and uh you know just with time and thinking about it and procrastinating a little bit um i finally want to you know at least kind of start taking the, the next step on it and that is to um in this video i wanted to kind of just do like an autopsy or tear down um basically take the whole system apart um, and really get a good understanding from a case perspective what needs to be fixed. Um, and it's something that needs to happen anyway. I kind of have to take it apart to be able to repair these side panels. So let's get started. Um, and I just want to show you off, you know, what's going on. So this kind of shows one of the ideas I had to try and fix it as well as the problem. So the problem is that the, um, the, the panel here, the little plastic bits that that hold this on are all like breaking or broken on the top they're all broken off right on the top they're all broken off all these are snapped um, on the front they're all snapped on the bottom they're still there right um, and on the back they're snapped and these are all supposed to fit in here and here and back here here and be down there somewhere and kind of snap slide in and and snap and hold into place but they don't um, one of the ideas i had to kind of fix it was i got these these magnets right this like flat magnets and i figured if i put them on here they could kind of link up with the metal shielding and it could just kind of hold into place and they do it holds into place but as you can see it's not it's not flush, um, which obviously isn't the way it's supposed to look. So I got to kind of figure out a better way to do that. Um, so yeah, I'm going to put this aside now, the side panel, because we're not going to need it as we're taking things apart. Um, so we can take a look inside here um, in the machine and you can kind of see, you might be able to see one of the things I had to do just to, to solve a problem is the original duck feet that were on this are gone, long gone. So I got these, um, these feet here, which are um, actually feet that you're supposed to put on like amps and things, like speaker amps and stuff. Um, so I installed those on the bottom here with some with some long screws and bolts, and that works well because they're tall enough to lift the case up. And you have to do that because all of these plastic pieces that make up the the panels and walls, they're all like two centimeters longer or go down two centimeters past the bottom of the actual case. Um, so it has to be up high enough to be able to, you know, for this not to push. And I think that's how all of these panels end up getting broken by the previous owner was the feet broke off and he just had it sitting on the floor every time he moved it around. The pressure on these panels from the bottom, the down, the upward pressure just caused them to stress and break over time. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done when it comes to, uh, to that. Yeah, so what I figured I would do here is I'm going to completely disassemble this. So I'm going to take everything out of it and completely take it apart. And that way, as, as I'm you know, working on fixing these panels and getting them properly attached to this case again, I don't have to worry about damaging any of the, the inside computer components. Um, and it also gives me a chance to be able to make sure that they're fully cleaned and tidied and all that stuff as well. So, um, I guess, um, the, the next thing to do is probably just, um, I'm going to lay it down maybe and just take all the parts out of it would probably be the best thing to do. Um, and not really worry about trying to take apart all of the top pieces. I mean, here I can remove this cause it's all loose on the top, um, you know, whatever pieces we're holding this on again are, are kind of, kind of busted and, and not working properly. I got to figure out how all of that goes together correctly so that I can, I can, um, reattach it in the future. So there you go. There's the top removed. That makes it easy. 
And then if I move around to oh, this side, um, you know, I got to figure out how all this comes apart because I can tell there's a little bit of looseness, I think, on the side panel and the front panel, at least at the bottom of the front panel. Um, that's going to have to get worked on as well. So I may not, I may not figure that out here on the video, but you know, at least we got the top and the side off. So I'm going to move the camera to the um, the top down view and lay the um, lay the tower down, and we can start you know pulling all the guts out. Okay, we're top down. Um, so I guess I'm just going to start pulling things out. Um, I'm going to start with uh, removing the IDE cables here. So we have our primary IDE controller, which is hooked up to these two hard drives here. And then our secondary IDE controller, as you can see, comes off and goes into this card. And we'll take a look at this card in a minute when we get it taken out. So secondary IDE controller goes into this card. And this is actually the card that goes and talks to that uh, media tray. And then we've got this cable here, which I think is a like mini it's either, so on the board it says I.O. here. So I'm wondering if maybe this is, this is either maybe a floppy controller, because there is a floppy drive in the, in, the, in the media tray, or this is for the keyboard and mouse. Not sure, um, it could be one of those two. Um, there is a random connector here, I'm assuming, that this audio connector cable was hooked up maybe to a modem because there is there probably was a modem in here at one point in time and this would have been the uh, like ring uh, connector for it to hooked up to the onboard uh, audio. So that will take out and then I'm going to remove this power connector here and it's like looped into this connector so there's an audio, another audio cable, I believe this is another audio connector, and this is the CD audio cable. So this goes into here, which goes up to the media tray, which plugs into the CD-ROM drive, and this is the connector to get down to the CD audio uh, for it. All right, um, so let's take, let's start taking cards out, I think, and get them out of the way. Because this is an older 90s IBM, this is in the era of them still using slotted screws, had not moved to using Phillips uh, screws as an industry standard yet, and uh, thankfully they didn't do what some of the other vendors of the time was, which like moved to things like hex screws or some other garbage like that. And we're just going to remove the three screws that are attaching our adapters that are installed in here. And then we'll take a look at what those are as we remove them. Screw number two, and now screw number three. I don't know if all of these cards are going to end up getting reinstalled in this system. It depends on, you know, if I find some other items or, or not. But this one, at the very least, will. And this is that connector. This is that card that goes for the media, the media tray. All right, so it's got this Altera Flex chip, right? As you can see here, this plugs into an ISA bus and we've got a pass-through for our IDE controller. I think a pass-through for floppy IO. And then we've got, for some reason, there's some pins here, jumpers here for master, slave and spare connections. And I'm, maybe that's trying to pass through the um, the secondary ID controller connectivity because it's only going to be connecting up to one drive maybe and then we've got the media connector there and then this big connection connection here is what goes up to the uh, the media tray yeah so pretty cool card um, and I believe that this button here there's a little button that you can see there. That is, I think, a manual power on or a, a bypass power on because there's no power button on the tower. And uh, if you had this plugged in without the media tray, you'd want to be able to turn on the computer and 
be able to turn it on. I think that's what this for. Well, you know, we'll obviously get a chance to test that sometime in the future, but there you go. So that, that's the card. Pretty cool. I've never seen anything. Um, I don't think anyone ever did anything like this, like what IBM did um, ever again, uh, for better or for worse. I mean, uh, the idea in a modern computer of having something like a, a Thunderbolt dock, um, you know, that you plug everything into and then your tower is sitting somewhere else is not an uncommon thing. I'm even seen on like Linus Tech Tips where he's got like his computer in his server room and he runs a Thunderbolt cable out to plug into a dock on his desk that he has everything else plugged into. It's a very similar concept to what, you know, IBM did in the mid 90s. Um, but it was clunky and kludgy and non-upgradable and, you know, proprietary and that's why it never made it anywhere else. But anyways, Cool card, cool idea, cool concept. I have no idea if something like this would work in any other system other than this one um, or not, but nonetheless, pretty awesome. All right, next up we have uh, this ATI Radeon graphics card. This is a, see right here, a Radeon 7000 PCI graphics card. And the reason why this is installed in the system is it's got, there's an ATI 3D Rage Pro on-board graphics as you can see down there and it's got like one megabyte or two megabyte of, of memory right you can see it here and then there's this sodium slot that you can upgrade the memory for it so two things one it's a low amount of memory so it sucks and two it's not a great video card and three there's no AGP slot on the system board because they use the AGP connection for the onboard graphics so you can only use a PCI graphics card if you want something better. However, what I think would probably be a better solution than putting in a PCI graphics card would be to get something like a Voodoo or a Voodoo 2 pass-through card um, and use that instead to get your 3D graphics. Because this Rage 3D Pro onboard card can handle desktop graphics pretty well on its own. So I might look and see if I can source something like that, which from an era appropriate perspective, you wouldn't necessarily have been buying a PCI graphics card to upgrade a system like this. You would have been, if you could afford to buy one of these, because these were the top of the line, most expensive IBM uh, PCs of the time. They weren't cheap. You probably could afford to buy something like a Voodoo card to put in here as well. Um, but that being said, this is a 64, 64 megabyte, I think, a 64 megabyte graphics card, which is way more graphics memory than you would have had at the time as well. So. It may end up this is a good card to put in this machine anyway from a power perspective. All right, last on the list here is a card that's probably not going to get reinstalled, and that's this Wi-Fi adapter. Oh, um, we have this Netcore. Netcore 54 meg. It's a wireless uh, BG uh, adapter. Um, obviously, BG is not uh, a very common... Uh, adapter type anymore there we go we can focus now and um yeah probably not going to be keeping this in the system we'll be looking at adding a regular uh gigabit ethernet uh card for network connectivity and not bother with the wireless connectivity on this system all right so now i think what we'll do is i'm going to unscrew pardon my left-handedness here i'm going to unscrew this screw here so we can remove the drive tray from the system and I think this is just yeah it just kind of notched in so it kind of goes like this and then pushes back and latches into place nice heavy metal here and we've got these this pair of hard drives one of them is probably the original hard drive uh, that this system would have come with um, but I don't know these screws are probably these screws don't look like they are the original screws uh, that this system would have come with. So it's possible that even the original hard drive has been replaced over time. Um, I'm just going to go off camera here for a second to, to remove these screws so we can take a look at the hard drives that are installed here. I'm not worried about the hard drives, um, their condition. I mean, we booted up, I booted up the machine and it does work, um, but I'm not worried about replacing these hard drives or if they're not the original or anything like that because um, I have the recovery discs uh, for this system, so I'm not so worried. So yeah, this is probably the original hard drive. Here we got this IBM uh, 4.3 gigabyte hard drive. That sounds like the right capacity 
uh, that, um, you know, this system would have come with for the base hard drive in like the 95, 96 time period. So this is probably the original IBM OEM hard drive, DCA-34330. Look at that. Cool. And, I, and it still works. So we may reuse this, although I don't know if I will. Maybe I'll put it as a secondary drive to back up to um, so I can have a larger main drive. But, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll figure it out. So I'm going to put this aside and then I got to get uh, this get this one off as well. So we've got this Mac store, uh, 40 gig hard drive, a diamond plus eight, and this is dated 2003. So this is much later in the future. Maybe uh, the person who bought this, who I bought from, I think he said he had this for quite a number of years. So I wouldn't be surprised if he picked it up and he upgraded by adding in this drive um, as secondary storage. So yeah. All right. I'm going to Put this aside. I'm not going to bother unscrewing it right now because um, it doesn't really need to be. We just wanted to look at what it is. And you can start to see now, um, looking down over here, you can see these little notches, these plastic notches. This is where that other side panel is latched in. And these are the types of plastics that we uh, were really worried about because when they break, it's not going to hold on as well, which you can see. I'm going to slide down here. You can, see, you can maybe see here, right? The notch in this part is broken. The plastic is broken right there and it doesn't slide down anymore. So the top part of the, the side panel is not holding on. So because there's the opening there, there's the chance that I could craft maybe glue something or acetone something, a plastic tab that can hold in this position instead um, and make something more permanent so that the panels don't break off again, at least the ones that aren't supposed to come off. We still have to solve the problem of that side panel though uh, in the future. All right, so next up, um, I guess what we'll do is, um, what do we take a look at next? Figure out what we can remove next, I guess. Um, I think maybe uh, we can, well, we can, we can maybe just bother taking out the, we can take out the, memory dims and the and the CMOS battery. So I'll just slide out the CMOS battery here. All right, we got this Sony CR2032. This is probably not the original battery, um, but it probably needs to be replaced. And then we've got our memory dims here. Very thin plastic tabs for the for the dim installations. All right, and for memory, we have 128 128, and I'm going to assume this is 128 as well because it looks like it's a matching dim for these. And it's hard to tell if, oh, why won't you focus? It does not like focusing. This, this phone sometimes is so irritating. I can't tell if that would be the original, I doubt that this is the original IBM memory that this system would have come with. Um, these are definitely not. These are definitely not. These are purchased from somewhere else. So 384 megabytes of RAM. Um, if this system will take 768, I will install 768 megabytes of RAM. Um, if it won't, um, then we can just stick with 384 still and that should be fine and this is as you can see it's sd ram the double notch so i've got lots of sd ram uh sticks collected and i'm pretty sure i've got quite a number of 256 uh, megabyte sticks available that we can possibly use if they will fit and work on this system so all right next up we are going to uh take a look at i guess removing um this power connector here. I'm going to unlatch from this part. Oh, it's in there. There we go. We got it off. And then, so it looks like the previous owner as well had done a little bit of surgery here on this, uh, on this uh, floppy power connector um, to be able to get power to the fan because they had upgraded the Pentium 2 processor that was on here. And um, the upgrade that they had came with this heat sink with a fan built in. So they wired in um, against the uh, against the wires on this power connector. So they're kind of linked now, linked forever. Um, so that's something that we have to deal with in terms of 
um, those being those being connected like that, um, and then the power supply being connected as well, um, is is a bit of a challenge uh, to remove all of that without causing any any other issues. Okay, I'm going to have to figure out what we're going to do where where that's concerned. Um, let me uh, let me just think about this for a second here. Maybe we um, maybe we remove. Well, I can't really move. I can't remove the processor because this piece here is blocking it off as well. So I have to remove that from the system first. And there is a, oh, look at that. I guess by the pressure of moving things around, look at that, our panel came off. So you can get a good look at the panel here, what's broken and what's not. These are still okay, these, these ones here are still fine. This one's still fine. Still fine, still fine, still fine. So it's just this one piece that's broken um, on this on this other back panel, which I guess is a good sign um, that it's just the one piece that needs to be fixed so that this side panel can go on pretty well. Let me move it aside. Okay, um, so now that we've uh, we've done that, I'm gonna flip this back up again and you can see right here, so this piece right here, I'll show you in a second, but you can see we've got the um, these connectors here and these are audio um, pass-throughs. One goes to the subwoofer and one goes to the speakers on the MM75 monitor. And for some reason, there's little pads stuck on the back here as well that I'm not sure what they belong to, um, but there's a screw here that I have to remove. So I'm going to take that off. And this should now just easily separate itself. I'm gonna take its power. Oh, it's a little bit dusty. So you can see here there's some there's some power regulation and caps going on there. Um, for us to be able to to preamp, I guess, going out to the sound, uh, the sound stuff, um, which makes sense. And you can see that. Can you see that little Bose label? There's a Bose label on that board. Um, so that's kind of cool. That Bose not only did the speakers, but it also did some of the preamp here. So that's a cool little component there, right? Um, so I'll move that aside, out of the way. And now that that is out of the way, we can remove our processor from the system. And we've got that Pentium 2, uh, MMX233, I think, processor. And what I'd like to do, if I could, I'd love to just be able to remove, ah, yes, perfect. So there we go. So we got the fan connector removed, and now we can set this, uh, we can set this guy aside as well so he doesn't get into any more trouble. All right. Uh, next on our list, now that we've got that cleared out of the way, we can unplug our 20-pin power from our system board. Oh, and look at that. Look what has been revealed down in the corner here. We have an errant floppy disk drive connector. So this system board, if you were um, not connecting up to that media tray, I guess you do have some functionality that you can still hook up. Um, you know, obviously your hard drives and floppy drives. I still don't know how you would power this system on without having um, that card at least installed with that button bypass because there doesn't appear to be um, standard pinouts for like a front panel um, connector, right? Like we don't really have anything like that anywhere in here. Um, power regulation. You know, none of these pins are really for doing any of that, so it's very unlikely that you could even power this board on without having that card installed at all. So, yeah, that is what it is, I guess. Um, I guess the next thing we'll do is... Does this side panel piece come off, or is this riveted in? I think this... It looks like there's a notch on either side. Um, it's hard to tell if there may be a screw on on this side that's holding it on. Um, but there's a screw here we could we could remove. It's a little tiny. Oh, this is a little tiny guy. I don't even know if that's the right. 
if that's the right screw for this piece. But um, it does allow me to remove <laughs> this entire section. So this is the like optional drive bay section. Um, apparently has some instructions on how to install this piece. Yeah, so there should have been a screw coming down from the top um, when I took the plastic parts off and that's missing. So I'm going to have to figure that out. But this would be, this spot would be if you did decide you needed to install additional hard drives or additional other drives, optical drives for some reason. This was one of the other problems with this design of this system was, you know, with that media tray, the idea was that this whole tower was like underneath your desk and sight unseen. Why would you install another optical drive into it? And now you completely do away with the reason why you bought the media tray to begin with. Anyways. So that is what it is as well. All right, so the next thing I think we're going to do is maybe um, to move the power cables out of the way and um, try to remove this power supply. I see some screws here, but I'm going to undo I'm going to undo the four black uh, IBM standard uh, slot screws because I think that part on the inside may be an assembly to be able to easily slide and hold the power supply in place. And we don't want to actually remove that from the power supply. So let's get these four screws out. And we got three out of four. And one more to go. Oh yeah, it's loose now. It's ready to come out. It's ready to come out. It's ready to be free. There we go. It's free. Yeah, so these were just the little metal slots here. So there we go. Our power supply is now... Ooh, look at that. Yeah, our power supply is definitely going to get some TLC cleaning uh, to make sure that... Oh, I can see the dust inside there. It's gross. Um, so <laughs> this is a nice Delta Electronics power supply, a DPS-200PV-76. This is a 200 watt power supply. Um, yeah, which is, you know, pretty much all you needed back then. Uh, yeah, so big bulky power supply. Um, I'm not worried at all that this thing still runs. Um, you know, this is, IBM did not skimp on quality power supplies back in the day uh, for, for their top end uh, Aptiva machines. All right, uh, now that we've got that done, um, what do we have left to do? We've got this fan. Um, and this fan's on these like, um, it's on these like rubber things, uh, which are not easy to um, take out once they've been installed. So I think I might actually just leave the fan installed in the system and not bother taking it out and then screwing it back in with screws. I'm just going to leave it because it doesn't have to come out uh, um, of the system. So the next thing we're going to do, this will be the last, I guess the last, the last piece to get removed. Uh, before we take off the front panel is going to be taking off the system board out of the out of the case here so I got one two three I'm going to be careful when I remove this as well because one of the feet that I installed um, these bolts are a little bit longer than they need to be let me move this out of the way. These bolts are a little bit longer, so you can see how the, this, the bolt comes up a little bit higher um, than it needs to. Um, this one is kind of like, it's not touching the board, but it's very close to the board. Um, so when I reinstall this, I'm probably going to like make sure that it's wrapped up in some electrical tape or something so that it you know never can have a chance to contact anything. Um, I don't want to get into cutting it down. I looked into doing that, but... I don't want it to mess the threads up and I don't really want to get into like, I don't have the, the proper tools to be able to do it properly and then make sure that there's no like microscopic shavings or something somewhere that's going to, you know, end up floating around and shorting something out um, within the system here. It looks to me from a, a, the arrangement of screws as I'm taking this off that it is using a standard arrangement in terms of where these screws are from a motherboard standoff perspective. So this would be a, a full ATX. Um, 
motherboard. Um, but where they are, one, two, three, one, two, one, two, like they're, they are, they do seem to be all in the normal places. So, you know, another IBM thing is they didn't go and like decide, oh, well, we're going to have this custom placement. So you would never be able to take this board out and put it into a different case or anything like that. Like, all right, so we got one click there. And now we can carefully remove our board. All right, there we go. So now we have our board removed from the system. This is our Aptiva 2142 board, uh, ready to go. Cool, look at that. We'll flip it over and take a look at the bottom. Look at this. Look at this, look at this piece of plastic here that the, that the slot is connected to, to like make it nice and firm and, and secure and raised off of the, the system. Even has an IBM part number. It's an IBM 12J5872. If you ever needed to order a replacement, <laughs> that's so cool. So IBM. All right, so this is out of the way now. As you can see on the back of the board here, um, a lot of the ports that you wouldn't actually even use. Um, you wouldn't use the PS2 ports because you'd be plugging directly into the media tray. You wouldn't be using this VGA port because you'd be plugging into, I think, I did, no, this, you would use the VGA port um, because the, the monitor will plug into here, but you wouldn't be using these audio ports because you'd be using that output to the media tray again from this guy over here that would go to the media, the, the, the MM75 and the subwoofer. Um, but you would still probably possibly use the printer, the serial, the game port, and these USB ports to connect to some other devices as well. So not all of them would be used, but not all of them would be not used. Yeah, words. Okay, so system board, we can now, um, we can put aside, I'm going to lay it on top of, I'm going to move the power supply over here off camera and just kind of balance the, the board a little bit. Okay, so the last thing to do here is to take a look and see what's going on with this front panel. And look at this, we can find now, look at all these little bits we're finding. Finding all these little bits in here. Um, oh, this is cool as well. I didn't even notice this. Look at this. Inside the case here, laid out throughout the inside of the case, these rubber seats, right, that you would expect to see like on the bottom of a device. They're underneath where the system board is to give pressure points, right? So it's that plastic piece on the motherboard, all of our standoffs and these all allowing like giving pressure release and stability for the system board. Like you don't see this, you don't see this anywhere. Um, you know, these, this attention to detail, this over engineering, you might call it is I'm always amazed by it, um, that it was like totally unnecessary. All right. So it looks like this should just, the front panel should just like shift down. The bottom clips look like they're broken on this side and this side here, but we've still got one, two, three, four, five, six clips that look like they're all still alive and well. So if I just kind of, oh, kind of shift down, it's hard to, it's hard to know if I'm doing it right. Um, but I don't see anything in here that's saying like, you've got to, you've got to like, unclip something before you can push it down uh, to be able to get it off. At least is not as far as I can tell. There isn't anything on here that's saying, and there's no instructions obviously that's saying, but there isn't anything that's standing out to me that's saying like you need to be able to push it down a certain way to be able to get it to release. And I'm afraid, obviously, of, of damaging it by applying too much pressure somewhere. So I might just leave this, I might just leave this for now until I can really get a good look. Maybe take these, take these spare panels off so I can really see what's going on underneath as well um, to remove it. Because I do want to take it off to be able to clean everything um, before and make sure that the way it goes back together is, is correct as well. Because I think all of these little bits have the ability to pop off and I want to make sure that everything is disconnected properly and can be reconnected properly effectively. All right, so I think that's probably gonna, gonna do it as far as disassembly goes. Um, not as bad as I thought it was gonna be in terms of you know the shape of the case. 
um, the damage of the, the side panels and stuff. It looks like only only that main side panel and the top panel are in like we're in really bad shape. Everything else seems to be fine. The only other repair that's going to need to get done is um, let me show you here actually. So I do have was included here is the the two megabyte upgrade, right? So as I mentioned, there's two megabyte on board for the graphics one, two, and there's two more. And you can install this sodium, but the little plastic tabs that are supposed to hold this on, common issue with these are snapped, right? So the metal pieces here are fine, but the little plastic bits that are supposed to hold these metal clips and allow them to have pressure have snapped, which means this card while you can put it in, it won't stay in, right? It's loose and it'll just do this after a little bit, right? And it won't stay. So um, I need to figure out a way to be able to make that work um, and stay down. Cause I'd like to just have it installed. I've got it, why, why throw it away? Even if it's just gonna be being used for the desktop, you know, 2D graphics part of the system, if I end up getting a Voodoo card, um, it'd be nice to have it here. Um, so I want to figure out a way to be able to install it That's not like permanently like gluing it down or something um, But some kind of way to be able to get this to stay and get pressure. Oh, look at that. I just just by touching it. I broke off the I Broke off the plastic bit. Look at that It's busted busted right off um, So um, yeah, that'll be it. That'll be it. I think for uh, for this view um, in terms of in terms of uh, taking this whole thing apart. So uh, hope you enjoyed this. Uh, if you have any ideas about how to uh, fix these panels, how to fix these little sodium clips, you know, if you've got ideas from trying to fix the same thing on like old laptops, um, let me know in the comments down below. I'd appreciate any advice you have um, in terms of best. Um, you know, best practices uh, for doing this. Um, in the meantime, I'm going to work on, you know, getting this thing cleaned up as best as I can and coming up with these ideas to put it back together. Um, and, uh, and then hope, you know, hopefully the next time you see this machine, it will be reassembled and just like new. Um, yeah. So uh, I hope you enjoyed watching the video. As always, I hope you're staying safe and healthy and we will catch you in the next one.